welcome to the MSCI Spring Capstone presentations. I'll start by presenting the program for today. You can find it on your, on your chairs. We'll start with the opening speeches by the Vice Rector of the University of Madeira, Professor Chelsea Fernandes, followed by the MSCI program director, Professor Monica Camere. Shortly after, the teams will be giving a sneak peek of their presentations with a two minute, minute madness and will be presenting that. We invite you all out to join us for a toast with the Madeira Moja that will be served in Mitty's garden. We wish you all a pleasant afternoon and thank you for coming. Show some of our ideas with you, 
and thank you all for being here. So, uh, my name is RJ Villaflor. Um, I'm representing Studio 80. Uh, we're the team that's working with Colab this semester. Uh, so, by a show of hands, how many people have bought something recently, either at a store or online, um, whether it be a piece of clothing or an electronic device? Okay. Uh, so, of the people who raised their hands, how many of you have had to call or email or tweet that company that you bought that item from in order to ask about uh, where your order is or possibly how you were charged? Okay. So, basically, uh, there's an entire infrastructure that supports that person that you're talking to. Um, the, uh, this infrastructure includes the people, the supervisors, the managers, the agents uh, that help that person that you're talking to on the phone, or possibly an email, uh, answer your questions. Um, and this infrastructure is called contact centers. Um, the tools that these contact centers, uh, these contact centers use are actually very important. Uh, for example, suppose you actually get upset with the person that you're talking to, um, and you leave the call, you hang up. Uh, that could have some serious repercussions for that contact center. Uh, people could get fired, the customer experience for that customer could be really bad, and it could mean bad business. So the tools that this contact center uses are extremely important. And that is the focus of our project and what we'll be uh, talking about later today. Thank you. In this project, 
We aim to introduce interactive technologies to maximize hotel efficiency, improve guest experience, and increase hotel revenue. So in our approach to this project, <coughs> we began by trying to understand both the current state of tourism in Madeira and of technology in hotels. We then thought about what the future might look like. And thinking about the future, we studied trends in traveler attitudes and tried to imagine how those trends would apply to Madeira. Finally, we looked at how hotels are innovating, both in their service offerings and in their use of technology. And next, I'll go over the stages of our project. We began in January with research which continued through April. We then synthesized our results, transitioned over to ideation, where we are now. And this is the structure we'll follow through this presentation. And Mike will start us off with our current state research. Thanks, Kathy. So as Catherine said, we started our research with looking at the current state of tourism here in Madeira. We started by taking it to the streets. We went out and interviewed tourists in several high traffic areas. Our objective was to understand their journey up to the point that they were at on the trip. We also went on tourism activities ourselves and activists in the shoes of tourists, which also gave us the chance to, to spend the day with people who were in the same thing and interview them in depth. We did a competitor analysis. We looked at online content primarily, um, hotel websites, and reviews online. And we went to some of the leading hotels on the island and observed guests in the, in the public spaces in the hotels. And what did we find from this? We found that one, tourists choose hotels for a range of reasons. Some are very particular, like those who go to boutique hotels like the CR7. Others are looser and look at more general criteria for the amenities and the location. Tourists also plan to go do activities independently, renting a car going out on their own, or through guides that they find on their own through their hotel or through their location. Europeans choose Madeira for its climate and flexibility. It seems to be echoing from everybody. Also, we put this into an ecosystem. Um, so guests start out by learning discovering Madeira primarily through their friends and family and their own communities. Um, when they get here, they uh, they provide payment in exchange for traditional hotel services, but they also get information from staff. Same applies with guide companies when they go do activities. And it's important to highlight that. The staff and the guides are part of the, Madeira, the community here in Madeira, and they're very in tune with what's happening here. Um, so next, we, we started looking at tech insights um, within hospitality. So we did a secondary, some secondary research. We found five apps that um, are used in the industry, and we reviewed them. We also went on service safaris into exemplary hotels um, within mainland Europe. Um, so what do we find here? We found that many tech products aren't maintainable. Um, this is a 6,000 euro chair that was at the Evolution in uh, Lisbon, um, and it wasn't working um, when we were there. Uh, we also found that apps are similar. When they first are released, they're great, five star reviews. After three years, one star reviews, people say they're worthless even in the reviews um, because of the maintainability. We also found that custom content can be poor quality. That takes a lot of maintenance and overhead to make sure that it's up to date and relevant for people. We also found that tech can be gadgety. If it's not part of a service, uh, it can just be there for the sake of being tech. Um, that's one thing that we found over and over, that there was technology that was just kind of there. Um, so these are insights and risks that we found with technology in the current state of hotels. So next, Trish is going to talk about um, our future state research. Thanks, Mike. So the service safaris that Mike had mentioned earlier not only inform us about the current use of technology, but also give us insights into how hotels were successfully implementing uh, service models, new service models. And we studied the different touch points to understand these a little deeper. And the insights that we found from these are hotels are rethinking the role that staff plays when interacting with guests, whether that's in the digital or physical realm. Hotels are investing more in public spaces as conduits for guest interactions with other guests and locals through service offerings and local events. And lastly, hotels are providing local businesses with comfortable meeting spaces through conference room rentals, meeting room rentals, and additional add-on services such as catering. To summarize, after conducting those seven service safaris at specific hotels within Europe, we realized that forward-thinking hotel experiences rely more on service innovations than they do with standalone or simple tech solutions. 
The next phase of our research included methods and insights on the future of travel. So we conducted a participatory design workshop with the local Métis community, and our objective here was to explore design ideas that these individuals would have when they took their own travel experiences into consideration in the context of our project scope. We also reached out to expert travelers within our network. And here we wanted to ask these well-traveled individuals about their experiences as well to gain insights on their travel needs, their accommodation preferences, and their thoughts on the future of travel. And what we discovered through these research methods <coughs> was that authenticity is a priority. Travel travelers want experiences that feel genuine within the context of their travel destination. Small encounters are delightful. These can include chance occurrences while on a travel journey. And information you can trust comes from real people. Creating trust is very valuable to travelers. Um, to summarize, the future of travel is about more information, empathy, and awareness. And to quickly go over our review of our research, here it is by the numbers. We conducted 32 interviews of tourists on the island, held a workshop for 16 participants, observed hotels using five fly-on-the-wall sessions, performed seven service safaris, extensively reviewed 10 academic papers, and reviewed five mobile apps within the industry. 76% of our research was conducted with Europeans, 80% of our participants were traveling to Madeira, and the remaining percentages included perspectives from a variety of other travelers. Next, Sarah will walk you through the percentages. So over the course of all that research, we had the chance to interact with a lot of travelers. 32 interviews, we saw 16 workshop participants, and countless secondary research impressed upon us the true breadth of approaches when it comes to travel. We got to know what people truly value from their vacations and what made them meaningful. As Trisha shared, authenticity, small encounters, and reliable information were recurring themes. However, different patterns emerged in the behaviors and attitudes people adopted to achieve these goals. We found a spectrum of travel styles, from active to relaxed, spontaneous wandering to more meticulous planning. So next up, we will highlight three profiles and introduce you to people who come to Madeira and those we want to see more of, too. So first up, we have Margaret. And Margaret has been to Madeira before, but she's going to come again with some of her gal pals because she knows what to expect. She knows she's going to have a restful time here. She can play bridge on the patio with her friends in the sun. She can go on some pre-booked Lovato walk packages. She knows that she'll be taken care of and comfortable. We also have Hans. Hans is also traveling with friends, but this will be his first time in Madeira. He found it through some Google searches, um, and decided to come here because he knows about all the active opportunities. And he's been doing a lot of research on his own. He feels very comfortable with tech and uh, has an aptitude for navigating the different tools and logistics. And then we also finally have Anna. Anna is a new mom. She has a couple children. Um, and she wants to take a family vacation that can accommodate the needs of a few different members of her family. Um, she also craves a little bit of flexibility and time to herself, but at the same time wants to make sure that she is cultivating and enriching experiences for her children. And then he will walk us through some concepts. So based on our research, we identified opportunity areas, and then we did brainstorm sprints to generate many ideas, and then converge to our finer ideas to come up with three concepts. Our first concept is about helping hotel guests find unique activities that are authentic and offer the impact. And these activities could be a mix of unique offerings from partnerships with local small-scale services and are only available through the hotel. And in our first scenario here, we have Margaret and her female friend who has just arrived from Madeira. They're sunbathing in their hotel lobby and they're thinking of what activities to do tomorrow. They decide to check out the hotel's in room iPad, which has an offering of a variety of activities. They're interested in an activity that's less touristy and more authentic, and so they do a search under the appropriate category and are presented with a list of local activities that they haven't seen in any guidebooks. 
One night, the age catches their eyes. It's an art workshop at the local quinta, and decides to book it. And with one click, the application makes a charge to their room. Our next concept is featuring the hotel's employees' local expertise to help guests learn about and feel connected to Madeira. In this scenario, <coughs> the and her family is at the airport, waiting to board their flight to Madeira. She browses the hotel's website on her laptop and sees a series of friendly videos created by the staff. These videos introduce topics like staff's favorite spots on the island or useful Portuguese phrases, and Anna and her kids watch the video to pass time. When the family arrives at the hotel, she recognizes some of the staff's faces and feels a sense of familiarity. The next morning, Anna approaches the front desk to ask the concierge for recommendations on where to go. The concierge hands her a map with his favorite spots on the island and proceeds to mark the map with tips on where her kids might especially enjoy. Anna is pleased to get a local's perspective to help her family navigate the island on their own. And our last concept, I'm sorry. While out exploring Madeira, Anna has a few questions about where to go eat and how much to tip waiter, waiters. So she pulls out her phone and messages a staff in the hotel. And within minutes, the staff gets back to her and with the all with the ease of texting a friend. Our last scenario here is about providing a seamless way for guests to rent equipment or unusual items that will enrich their stay. <coughs> These items could be practical items such as cars or high equipment or more fun things like instruments. So we have Hans here and he wants to do a hard full day hike tomorrow. And so he decides to rent some trekking poles and a big pack. He goes onto the hotel website and reserves them for tomorrow's hike. And then he gets up early the next morning and stops by the front desk to pick up his gear. He hikes all day and is able to do more than that he could have with the limited equipment that he had packed for his trip. Next, Catherine will talk about how we begin to, we begin to compare concepts and our next steps. So after coming up with these concepts, our next step was to figure out how to evaluate them, to choose one to pursue in the design phase. And we've already begun this evaluation process. Um, here we've created a subjective rating system for our most important criteria for evaluating concepts. And those criteria include project fit, maintainability, revenue potential, guest experience, value proposition, and risk. Comparing the concepts across these categories, we can see some trends in which concepts might be most promising. Unique activities and employees as experts seem to be the stronger concepts, but we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. To conclude, so far we've conducted research into the current state of technology in hotels and tourism in Madeira. We've looked at the future trends for travel. We've created personas and generated concepts, which we just presented. Next. We'll resume this project in September with ideation, design, prototyping, and testing our solution. Thank you all very much for being here, and we'd love to take any questions. So today we're actually going to answer three questions for you. Uh, the first question is going to be, what's your problem? Uh, this is where we're going to explore. Uh, Niraj is going to explore the uh, problem space uh, that was presented to us from our client collab. Uh, the second question we're going to answer for you is, you want to take this outside? Uh, this is where uh, Yanjing is going to talk about how we took our research out into the field so that we could learn more about contact centers inside contact centers. And the third question we're going to answer for you is what are we going to do about it? Uh, basically here, Carolina is going to talk about the concepts that we've generated, the ideas that we've generated, to possibly solve the problems and the insights and the opportunities that we found uh, during our research. 
So first, I'll hand it off to Niraj to talk about um, our problem space. Thanks, Andrew. So, um, yeah, so our, our client is Golab. Uh, Golab is a company based in Lisbon uh, that creates uh, software tools for contact centers. These contact centers serve companies around the world. Um, so Colab responsibilities for these contact centers is not only to support these contact centers, but also to support the needs and the goals of the clients who, who these contact centers serve. Um, Colab's challenge for us is their product called Nivitalk. Uh, Nivitalk is a contact center system that allows contact center workers to access the various tools in a cloud-based browser uh, interfacing product. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, after understanding our clients, uh, um, after understanding our client their needs and goals, uh, we set up a mission for for our team for the rest of the semester. Uh, we are communicating this mission uh, as a statement, which we are calling as a hard statement. So our hard statement is that we want to design a scalable cloud-based contact center system that easily onboards new users while still serving the needs of advanced users. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Yantin, uh, she who's going to talk about how we went up into the field uh, to understand the needs of our clients. So I'm going to talk briefly about our research. Um, over the course of the semester, um, we went through several phases. As you can see here, the first phase is preliminary research between the start of the semester in January until March. And during, the, during this time, um, we read some basic information about how to contact center work. And after that, we immersed ourselves in contact center by traveling to several places in Europe. And then we synthesized our data. And we generate some insights based on the data we um, synthesized. And finally, we um, we ideated on our, some of our ideas on um, insights, opportunities, and some problems we found. Um, so during this semester, we applied three research methods. First, we did interviews in context. Um, this is where we interviewed contact center workers in their workspace. We found several things. Um, the first is we found that the report features are not often needed for, um, are not well supervisors needed. And um, we also found that they use a third party tool, the Visio, to designate which calls are answered by which agents. And lastly, um, a lot of um, people we interview, they say that they oftentimes have to ask co-ops employees to help them to use the tools. And the second method we, um, we adopted is uh, observations. Since we were not, not allowed to interview the agents, we observed them while they're working. Um, so we also found, we found mainly two things about the agents. First, agents oftentimes take work breaks all at the same time. So during that break, no one will be able to take the calls. And the second thing is, agents often had that time when they were not receiving calls. And the third method is user interface test. So after we understand how the contest center work, um, we were able to um, log into the Nubitalk platform test the user interface by ourselves as new users. And here we found that for new users, there's not enough support. And also, there are um, basic design issues <coughs> that can be easily fixed. And next, um, Carolina is going to start talking about the ideas we generated out of our research. Thank you, Nancy. So, after gathering the data from our research, uh, we have the brainstorming session and we came up with three different concepts. So the first concept was to improve the user support. So this is John. John is a contact center for his new company. So he started using Nubitalk, but he's faced with a problem when he was configuring the contact center. 
The system automatically recognizes the problem to suggest a possible solution. If the solutions provided by the system aren't helpful, the system connects John to an IT engineer that can help them with this problem. So for the second concept, we aim to eliminate third-party tools. Um, with the current platform, John has to juggle between different softwares in order to create a content center. So what we want is to redesign the platform in a way that will eliminate the need to use uh, third-party tools, adding more features that nowadays they only have to uh, they have to use other softwares in order to do that. Uh, this will allow John to create his contact center just by using the result. So our last concept is to provide flexibility to the agents. So this is Julia. Julia is an agent uh, at John's contact center and her responsibility is to pick up calls and answer emails from different clients. So today is a slow day at the contact center and she hasn't received an email or a call for 30 minutes. <coughs> So she decides to grab a coffee from the vending machine. Uh, on her way back to the desk, she receives a call. But because the headset is connected to Nubital, she can, she is able to pick up the call without having to rush to her desk. And Nubital is also a responsive platform, so Julie can open it in, on her smartphone and update the client's information. So now, RJ is going to finish our presentation. Thanks, Karen. So that concludes the concepts that we've generated, as well as our presentation. Uh, so just to reiterate, what we told you is about a problem space that was presented to us by our client Cola at the beginning of the semester. Uh, basically, they wanted to have us build a cloud-based contact center system that consolidates all the tools that you might need uh, at a contact center in one tool. Uh, the next thing we told you about was how we did our research, how we actually uh, Acquired this information that we have now about contact centers, contact center workers, their goals, their objectives. And finally, we told you what we could possibly do about it as we go into our fall semester where we'll actually be designing, implementing, and prototyping a solution uh, for our project. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we'd greatly appreciate them and try to answer them as best as we can. Thank you.
Um, a few key exhibits I want to point out is the hallway of lights um, with the green benches. It's a very unique space, very beautiful, um, and really kind of drives some of the aesthetic we need to be aware of with our project. Um, the other side is the renewables and interactive section on the second floor, which many of the kids pointed to as their favorite part of the museum. Um, they're extremely interested in renewables, um, which is great to see. However, that part of the museum is a little bit more static and is mostly poster-based, so we believe this is a great opportunity for some innovation. Um, my, our HUN statement um, is to create an interactive learning exhibit, which um, distinguishes us a little bit from the other teams because there's um, different parts in learning than there is with HCI. Um, so as, as you're looking at our projects, we're not so much identifying needs as a teaching moment. Um, and then also to showcase the materials and unique energy system through a multi-sensory and inclusive experience, which is another unique part of a museum experience because you're often very brief moments in time. So identifying the most important parts to teach is essential. Um, briefly, I'll walk you through our tools. Um, we did some expert interviews. A few of our experts are in the room today. Um, that was to help us get situated kind of with renewable energies and gain a basic understanding of the problem space. Ethnographic observations were used to understand the museum um, experience. We did observe tourists and um, students. Gorilla interviews targeted uh, what locals know about renewables and really led us to ask questions of what do locals need to know. If, you know, do they need to explain the entire process or just certain points of renewable energy? Um, then we moved to museum case studies to kind of understand some of the design behind museum exhibits. Literature reviews, we did to ground ourselves in all of our topics and kind of weave this thread throughout. Um, then social media helped us understand how people were responding to the museum. And finally, design toolkits led our ideation process. Um, and finally, synthesis. And don't worry, I'm not walking you through the whole list, but a few things that I really want to point out is we identified a lot of key themes, which will be important when we walk you through our concepts. Um, we use models to help synthesize the data and kind of gain a mental understanding of where all these different fragmented pieces kind of fit together. Um, and then also we sort of address design implications. Um, so next we'll move to concepts. We'll walk you through that. Thank you. Okay, so basically, I'm just giving you the structure of the concepts that we're going to introduce. First, we'll introduce the basic idea behind the concept, and then we'll go into the reasoning behind it. So, this is where some of the research insights come in, and then we'll give you a scenario to explain how it works. So the first concept is the Race to 100% Renewable Energies. This is basically an exhibit that compares the renewable energy usage and challenges in different countries. So the purpose of this exhibit is to basically enhance inclusivity in the museum. Uh, this was a common issue uh, throughout uh, some of our research. And so we wanted to be able to create an exhibit that resonates with tourists on an emotional level. For example, a lot of people liked some of the uh, machinery that was from the UK. And so they were given a chance to relate, but this uh, theme did not continue throughout the rest of the uh, museum. In addition to that, we would also like to foster inclusive communication and increase uh, some of the translation that's available in the museum. Um, right now, some of the uh, translation is only limited to the sections that have the mach machinery from the UK, and so we would like to create an additional exhibit that allows um, additional people to be able to interact with. Um, again, the frustration with the translation was uh, pretty, uh, pretty extensive throughout all of our research methods. And you can see some of the quotes at the bottom where people um, were basically stating this through our interviews and in addition to some of the reviews that we read. And then so in regards to this exhibit, we hope that people can also engage with it even if they don't have a technical understanding of the material. So for example, we know that a lot of energy professionals really love this museum, but what about their companions? Can we create something that allows them to engage as well that isn't too technical in nature? And so we hope that this exhibit will be a little more approachable because we don't want to focus on uh, information that is too technical. And so what we plan to teach with this is to um, increase the international connection awareness. So we want people to understand that their sustainable behaviors are not limited to their home country, but it actually impacts people abroad as well. Furthermore, we would like people to understand what some of the barriers are to 100% renewable energies in their home country, and we want them to understand um, what some of the limitations are and what the potential features could be where they're from. 
So how might we do this? Right now we're considering creating an interactive data visualization. Um, we're also considering perhaps doing a digital art display. It will kind of continue that theme. For example, there's a there's like an art display area in the museum, and there's a space that's reserved for that. And sometimes people are confused by uh, by that area. They don't understand why it's there. And so this will create some continuity from energy to art. And then our last uh, example is a tactile interactive exhibit um, to give people something to interact with and use their hands and just something to get away from the you know the obvious screen, obvious touch screen. And so now Jessica's going to walk you through the personas. And these personas are basically representations of common visitors in the museum. And then she'll also demonstrate a scenario as well. Thank you, Christine. Emily and Rupert represent a variety of data that we've gathered, mostly through interviews about tourists who visit the museum. So they are tourists. They're an older couple from the UK. And we have one energy professional, Rupert. And Emily is less interested. She sees all these technical displays and she just feels like maybe this museum isn't for me. So now we're going to walk with them through this idea. So basically, Emily and Rupert are walking through the museum. Something catches their eye. Oh, it's very colorful, it's very bright, I see English. How very interesting. So they're drawn over to this display, this interactive visualization. And they start looking at it. Oh, look, the UK, what's going on here? Okay, this represents a race to 100% renewables. So what we're seeing here is the progress toward 100%. Why is the UK ahead of some and behind others? They really want to know. So they start hitting buttons on this interactive visualization, and it tells them stories about the UK, and why they are where they are, and the opportunities to get even further along this race. So now James is going to walk you through our second concept. So our second concept is Lovadas, an adventure in time, which we're seeing as a storytelling approach to immerse the public in the history of the Lovadas and in the future of hydropower generation. So why is this something we want to do? Um, we talked about Lehman a little bit in the last one. In our research, we found that stories are a great way to get people who don't know things about a subject into the subject. Um, it's an entry point. In our interviews, we learned that lots of people who were there were looking for a bit of a narrative through the museum. And they felt it was missing there. And in one of our literature reviews, we read that constructing stories in the mind is actually one of the best ways for people to learn things and understand things. So since stories give blame away into that subject, that's, that's why we'd like this exhibit to, to reflect that. We'd like to use a story to teach something. Um, Multisensory. Um, exhibits was another idea that came up a lot in our research. Um, digital technologies are allowing exhibits to be more and more immersive. Um, some of the museums that we visited that we remember the most had some of the most immersive exhibits in them. So if you look here, you'll see our team member, Bria, if you can see it. Um, she's on a bike about uh, 20 meters in the air, I'd say, um, on a tightrope, just kind of pedaling back and forth. Um, as many of her senses that were being used were engaged right then, that's one of the exhibits we remember the most, it's one of the exhibits we talk about the most because it was such like a, a startling immersive experience. Um, so since, since we know that multi-sensory exhibits can affect us this way, we'd like to create something like that. We'd like to use an immersive experience to transport visitors to a different time and to, to remember what we're talking about. Um, so we also plan on this exhibit focusing on the subject of Lovatis. Um, Lovatas are very important in Madeira for the tourism, um, for the, the cultural heritage, and for, for energy. They, they transport water for energy, they transport water for irrigation. Um, and we saw from a variety of different sources, from expert interviews, from talking to people, from looking at the tourism report. Lovatas are a big deal, you all know that. Um, so as a result, we, we like Lovatas to be a main subject of this exhibit. From some of our guerrilla interviews, we went on and talked to various people from Madeira about what they understood about renewable energy. And we learned that actually many Madeirans don't know that hydro energy is being used, and in fact is about a tenth of the energy that Madeira generates every year. Um, so as a result of that, we'd like, to, we'd like to make that a teaching moment. That's something we can teach people that they might not know. And it connects back into Lovato as well. So, we'd like to teach through this exhibit the history of Madeira, um, Lovatas and their uses, 
and uh, concepts about hydropower. So how might we do that? We're envisioning it potentially as a time machine. We might use some aspect of virtual reality or an enclosure with a lot of screens. Something that's tangible you can touch and something that gives you some kind of physical feedback. So I will pass it off to Jessica to talk about who and how that might work. Thank you, James. Maria is a composite of the many observations and interviews that we did with high school students in Madeira. So that she is a local, she's very interested in Madeira's unique energy, but she doesn't like to get it through lecture. She gets so many lectures, she wants something new. So she wants to be able to walk through the museum and do something social. And she also wants to be able to explore the potential for pursuing energy as part of her future. So now we're going to walk through this concept with Maria. So she's with a friend, of course, because that's what she wants to be doing. And they're walking around and they see this strange enclosure. What is this? So they're curious about the enclosure. They walk into it. They realize they're in a time machine. They get to move to the past. They get to move around the present. And what they do first is they go into the past and they start to explore through an adventure game uh, the harrowing, perilous, and very heroic building of the Lobatas. So they're doing different adventures. They're swinging around on ropes, planting dynamite, creating tunnels in the mountains. This was all very dangerous, but very important because they're bringing water from the north to the south of Madeira. So she's involved in this heroic mission and it helps her feel more like this adventure in history is more real, more salient, more important, more part of her. And then the present, she then explores how hydropower works. What do the Lobatas do for hydropower? She's exploring that also through a very personal and emotive experience. <coughs> and now Stephanie's going to walk us through our third concept. Thanks, Jessica. So our third concept is the microclimate stop. It's an interactive exhibit that demonstrates the difficulty of managing renewables within the dynamics of microclimates, which is a really unique aspect of the Madrid ecosystem. So one of the main things that we wanted to use in this exhibit is the idea of shared experiences. There are a lot of museums where exhibits are for single visitors, but we realize that a lot of people enjoy having a shared experience in the exhibit. So we really wanted to focus on um, we also, looking at our exhibit, exhibits, we put them into an engagement graph where we plotted them with interaction and learning versus the number of users. So you can see that they're pretty spread out. And that means that the number of users doesn't really affect um, like in a negative or positive way towards an exhibit. So that just means that we need to really focus on designing for that number of users. Um, there's, there's a good way to design it in a way that will be effective for the exhibit. Um, so, shared experiences are shared in museums. So, this exhibit will be designed specifically for interaction in pairs and small groups at the exhibit, at the museum. So, we also know that contextual exhibits elevate the understanding of the topic. We know that things work better in context. We know this through a lot of um, different museum exhibits that we saw during our research. So, for example, this is a picture at the Dynamic Earth Museum, which is a geologist's office. And you can see that it looks like a geologist's office. And this really immerses the visitors in that experience and gets them to believe that they're in that office and learn more because of that. Um, so the exhibit that we envision will be in a simulated modern environment so that the visitors will be immersed in that environment. So we also wanted to include multi-sensory components that James talked about earlier. Um, so Visitors will be able to see, hear, and also feel the effects of the Madeira ecosystem while they're involved in this exhibit. Um, so how can we do this? We can do this through using a connect for motion sensors, um, projections, um, additional weight and motion sensors, but also wearables. There's a lot of different ways that we can think about implementing this um, that we're currently exploring. Um, and this exhibit will teach about Madeira's unique energy ecosystem earlier, which is the microclimates and other um, additional things. We'll also be able to showcase the environment and the landscape of Madeira and also talk about the microclimate effects on renewables, how the microcli microclimates affect um, when renewables can be used and when they can't be. And now this is going to talk about who and how. Thank you, Stephanie. 
So here we have Anna, Saul, and Adriana. They're a composite of, of various families that we've been researching. So they're a, a tourist a family from the mainland, from mainland Portugal, and they're here doing a family vacation. They want to create some nice family memories. And also they have such a young little girl. She's only five years old. They wanted to be able to run around and be free. So now we're going to walk with them through this one, which I really have to come out here because this is an embodied game here. So what we have here is Adriana finds this incredible map. It's all of Madeira. It's right on the floor here. And it's flashing. It's got lights moving across it. She gets very excited by this, and she's drawn to it. She runs over to it, and the first thing she realizes is where her feet go changes what's on the map. So she starts stomping around, and she realizes she's an energy grid. She's grabbing sunlight. She doesn't know the word energy grid, but she realizes she's grabbing sunlight. There are these bars that are going up and down. The energy is, is doing this and that. And she's stomping around, and her father says, huh, I wonder what happens if I get on this map. So he gets on the map, and he turns into a storm cloud. So he starts moving around blocking sunlight. He's blocking sunlight, and she's trying to get more sun over here, more sun over here, running around, and they're interacting on this map. But also that storm cloud is replenishing the lobotas, creating hydropower. So now she can grab on the sunlight with hydropower. So she's stomping around trying to make sure we're staying on renewables and not flipping to, to fossil fuel use. And then what this is illustrating, of course, is the complexities of keeping on renewables only in a microclimate system. As the microclimates cause the sunlight and rain to move rapidly. So conclusions. Our next steps, not in order exactly, but exploring each concept in more detail is going to be our next step. Selecting one concept, maybe going back a little bit, going back a little bit, but we're going to select one concept within the first month in the fall, and then we're going to be prototyping and testing that concept with visitors at different stages, rapidly iterating. Then we're going to create a final prototype that our client can actually engage with and evaluate. So now just to reiterate our three concepts, because we love your feedback on them. Our first concept, Race to 100%, it's an interactive visualization. This allows people to engage with comparison between different countries on where they are in the race to 100% renewables. Our second concept, Lavada's Adventure in Time, allows you to move through time to explore the history and the present of the Lavada's in a very personal and motive way. And the third is Microclimate Stomp, which you just heard a lot about. That's our interactive map teaching about microclimates and the difficulties of staying on renewables in the DARE's unique system. Thank you very much, and we love your feedback. <laughs>